All right. Hey. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Gaslight. Um, if, you, if this is your first time here or, uh, or you don't know what we do, first of all, welcome. Um, we're Gaslight. We're a software design and development shop, and we try to solve tough solutions for businesses. So um, if, you're, if you like this sort of thing, we also host a ton of other meetups, um, more like specific technology focus. Uh, but please check out our website uh, for those. And we have a blog and all the things. So we're on the internet, on Twitter, so check us out. Um, so today we have a really cool talk by the guys over here at Simplify, Simplify 3D. Um, they specialize in 3D printing, and they'll tell you everything you ever wanted to know about 3D printing. Um, so we've got Natalie and Joey, and they're going to. Uh, whoa, hey. something happened. <laughs> it's okay. We're experimenting. All right, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to them, and they can tell you all the things you want to know. Okay, great. <laughs> so, can you 3D print a pizza? It's a question that I pose to you today. Um, as you can see from the title of our presentation, um, we're here to talk about everything you ever know, wanted to know about 3D printing, but we're afraid to ask. Um, so we're going to dive into some of those common questions that we hear about 3D printing. Um, starting with, um, can you 3D print a pizza? Um, but first, just by way of introduction, um, Kevin, thank you for introducing us. Uh, my name is Natalie Adler. I'm the Digital Marketing Manager at Simplify 3D, and I'm joined by... I'm Joey Kramer, and I'm a 3D printing engineer. Uh, and we work for Simplify 3D. Um, we're headquartered up in Blue Ash, and we're the leading global provider of professional 3D printing software. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but just so you know who we are. So back to my question. Can you 3D print a pizza? So where, even where did this question come from? So as we were prepping for this talk, um, I talked to Tammy and the team at Gaslight about, okay, ask your team, what kind of questions do they have about 3D printing? And she said, all they want to know is if you can 3D print a pizza. Uh, and actually, you can. There's proof right there. That is an actual pizza 3D printer. Um, so a couple of years ago, there was a company in Austin, Texas, and they got funding from NASA to build a food 3D printer. Why would NASA be interested in such a thing? Well, they wanted to be able to print nutritious food for astronauts during long space voyages. So this company got the funding to do this. So at South by Southwest, two years ago, they had a demonstration where they were live printing pizzas. So you're probably looking at this and wondering, first off, might not want to eat that pizza. Um, but second off, how, do, how does this actually work? How does this idea of 3D printing really work? And all it is, is laying down one layer at a time until a 3D object is constructed. So if you had a chance to come up and look at the 3D printer that we brought to show you today, you'll see that it's just laying down one layer, then another, then another. Almost like a really precise hot glue gun that's just putting down one layer at a time. So in this case, instead of laying down plastic, like a typical 3D printer would, it's got a layer of dough, then a layer of sauce, then a layer of cheese. So to answer the question, can you 3D print a pizza? Yeah, you can, um, but it's going to take a while. Um, most desktop 3D printers today, um, you know, printing layer by layer by layer, it, it tends to take a while to print even a small object. Uh, the grant that they got from NASA to do this was $125,000, a little bit more than what you might pay uh, down the street at La Rosa's or Papa John's. Um, and also kind of limited on ingredients. You know, you're not going to be able to squeeze out some pepperoni from a tube, or if you could, you probably wouldn't want to eat that. So while you can 3D print a pizza, um, you might not want to for the time being. <laughs> you might be better off just ordering it. So a lot of the questions we get about 3D printing are, can you 3D print blank? It's all about the possibility of what you could create. Uh, and as we've talked about, something like a pizza, a robot, a prosthesis, a car, human tissue, or even a 3D printer? The answer to all of these things is yes, in some form or fashion. Now, with something like a car or a 3D printer itself, are you going to print the electronic components? Probably not. You'll probably still have to buy those. But everything else that goes as a part of that, you can produce with a, a 3D printer and a desktop 3D printer like the kind that we have for you today. Um, so now, you've heard me say desktop 3D printing probably a couple of times. You might be wondering, you know, what the heck I'm talking about. So you've probably heard of 3D printing before. Hands up if you've heard of 3D printing, yes. So um, think of the 3D printing that you see in the news that they're doing over a GE when they're maybe printing a jet engine, something like that. Those are huge machines. Those are industrial 3D printers. They could cost a quarter of a million dollars or more. 
And I'm guessing you have to have some kind of you know, special security badge to get into the room where they have such a huge, expensive machine where they're printing really complicated parts, possibly even out of metal or other materials. On the flip side, you have desktop 3D printing. Or while industrial 3D printing, like the kind they use at GE, that's been around since the 80s, and it's called additive manufacturing. The idea of a desktop 3D printer, a machine that can do the same thing, but it's much smaller, that you can buy and put in your home, those have only been around for probably the last five to seven years. And it's really a, a growing industry. Um, so I made this little chart so you can kind of see where we are in terms of desktop machines like these right in front of you. So we're kind of transitioning out of the early adopters and into the mainstream. And it's a really exciting transition um, for everybody in the industry. But we're trying to overcome three main things um, before we can really break the barrier and have desktop 3D printing be mainstream. So those three things are, just to give you some background, cost, quality, and speed. And I even talked about those things a little bit with our pizza example before. Um, so for a 3D printer, yes, well, this is much cheaper um, than your 3D printer over at GE. Uh, it's still, what, $1,300, $1,400, and then there's the cost of the material to put in it. It's not a magic box that you can get for cheap and just manufacture things out of thin air. There's some cost that goes into owning one. Um, quality, you know, for things like one-off projects, prototypes, 3D, desktop 3D printing is going to have traditional manufacturing beat pretty much every time. But for large consumer goods, food, clothing, any mechanical parts, usually conventional manufacturing at this point still has the edge over 3D printing. So there's a lot of really exciting innovation going on in these fields. Um, when it comes to cost, um, there's a new Kickstarter every few weeks with an even cheaper 3D printer. Um, you can get a good machine for you know, 500 bucks these days, and that wasn't possible even a couple of years ago. Um, so there's some really exciting transitions going on there. And then lastly, speed. So this is where a lot of the innovation in the field is happening today. Um, there was actually a TED Talk a few months ago where they had um, produced a 3D printer that could produce an object in a fraction of the time of a machine as this, like we're talking seconds versus hours. Uh, so that was some pretty exciting um, innovations going on, but those still really aren't widespread. So before we get really into the mainstream, these are the three things we're trying to overcome. The good news is, People are working on it. Very, very smart people are working on it. So now we're going to talk about some of the main questions that we hear from people about 3D printing and kind of answer each one. We have a handful of those. And at the end, we'll open it up if you guys have questions that, that you've come and, and want to talk about today. Joey and I will do our best to answer those. So in terms of how does this crazy process actually work, I'm going to hand it over to Joey because uh, he's definitely the guru on this one. All right, so my job, I guess, will be to explain 3D printing with hopefully not getting too technical. Um, and the idea is that you have plastic here that comes in a solid form, and you melt it by pushing it through the nozzle. Over here, you apply a little bit of pressure, and then that way you have material moving uh, a filament flow to create your part. And then using stepper motors and belts and systems, whatever 3D printer you have on a different system, um, you will move around in the X, Y, and Z axis. And then therefore you have movement in all three axes and you have, fill, you have material moving through a nozzle. A lot of the desktop 3D printers, that will describe different materials that you can use or maybe even different style 3D printers. Um, but the main backbone of 3D printers would have to be the fact that everyone can get an Arduino now for so cheap. Uh, and those will control your stepper motors and stepper motors are extremely accurate. So the fact that people have such wide access to these stepper motors, which will move by, by a precise degrees, um, that will allow you to move maybe 20 millimeters to the left or 20 millimeters forward. And they're very accurate, which will allow you to create things such as this elephant. Whereas um, with the regular DC motor that you, make, you might get in your Happy Meal, those are a lot cheaper, but they don't have nearly the same accuracy. Um, so using the same technology as pretty much most of the CNC machines on the market, uh, the same file formats, you're able to produce these 3D printers that people now have in their homes, which is a great thing. Can you talk about the, uh, the layers? Yeah, little, so the thing. fact is that you print one layer at a time. You move in the X, Y axis, and then you move in the Z. Uh, so the entire bed will move down maybe once every minute for this print. And so the, the layer height we print at is about 0.2 millimeters. And the best way to describe that would be it's about two human hairs. A human hair is about 0.1 millimeter. So you're printing at about two, the width of two human hairs at a time, and that's how far this is moving down, about once every minute. Um, so if we want to pull the room a little bit and get some guesses how many layers this was, and we'll just give it out to whoever's closest. I think that's, yeah. That was the idea here. So how many layers do you think it took to print that lovely pencil holder? Don't be shy. Just guess. Anyone want to yell at me Any now? takers? Yeah. Which what? A thousand. A thou we've got a thousand. Do I hear a different number? A thousand. 
50,000? 50,000 layers. Anybody else? Five, we got a 5,000? 2,200. Uh, unfortunately, no one said $1, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that's about 900 layers. Uh, so who's, who is closest? I think so. Yeah. That was you. Nice job. Round of applause for guessing numbers. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, so Joey talked a little bit about um, this plastic that we're using to print. Uh, and it's called filament. Um, those of you that are a little bit familiar with um, 3D printing and production might already know that. Um, but I did want to take a minute just to talk about some of the cool things that are being done with filament right now. So what we're using here today is something called PLA. It's a very common 3D printing filament and it's actually usually corn or soy based, so it's biodegradable. Um, the other really popular one um, that we've also brought to show you today is ABS. Um, probably each and every one of you has come in contact with ABS before. Raise your hand if you've ever played with a Lego. Same material, so that's kind of cool. Um, but if you don't want to print in a shiny plastic, um, you also have a lot of other options these days. So um, very top one with the owl and the box and all of that, that is made to look like wood, but it's actually plastic filament with wood fibers. Um, the Iron Man helmet is also plastic, um, but they come in a metallic kind that you basically buff and shine until it looks just like metal. Um, so that's pretty cool. The shoe here is a flexible filament, and that's, uh, if you get a chance to come up after and take a look at this phone case that was also printed with a flexible filament. This is a big deal if you're making custom printed footwear, it needs to be flexible with your foot. Um, and then we talked about printing pizza, so what could be better than that? Chocolate. Up there, uh, you know, the top right is a picture of a, a chocolate printer, um, making some cubes out of melted chocolate. And then this very last image um, is exciting for people that are sick of printing in one color. Um, so they're making, uh, I see a nod back there, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, they're inventing filaments now that enable your printer to print in the full spectrum of colors so you can really produce anything your heart desires. So um, you kind of learned a little bit about the mechanics and the materials and what goes into it, um, but now I'm gonna walk you through how to actually print something from start to finish. You know, if you, you have a 3D printer, where do you start? Um, so anybody out there familiar with CAD, computer-aided design, got a few engineers in the room that maybe have used that before. Um, that's what you need to start with um, for any 3D printing project. If you're going to produce a three-dimensional model, you need a three-dimensional file. <laughs> um, so luckily for people like me that have no idea how to use CAD and wouldn't know where to start, the internet exists uh, and it's a wonderful place full of free uh, models that you can download and use. So I'm going to go to one of the biggest sites for that uh, right now. So um, thingiverse.com, some of you out there may have used this before. It's one of many um, out there where you can go and find, you know, it's almost kind of like scroll through like Pinterest and find a 3D model that you might want to print. Today we're printing elephants. Um, so I found this elephant that's really cute that I want to print today. So I would click and download the file. And then my next step would be to open it um, in a 3D printing software. And what do you know? It's our 3D printing software that we make and sell. <laughs> so... Um, 3D printing software, you may be wondering like, why I bought this printer, why would I ever need software to go with it? Um, well, you have to take a CAD model and translate it into instructions that the 3D printer will understand. So the model that does that, the uh, software that does that translation is a software like the kind that we make, a 3D printing software. So um, what you can do in the software is, you know, make, uh, you can make changes to the model, you can visualize how it works, um, you can... Uh, move it around if you want to print a bunch of them and you want to arrange them a, a different way on the build plate. If you want to have the elephant facing a different direction, you can do that here. Um, you can decide you print a really, really big elephant or a really, really small elephant. You just can kind of size it and, and play around with it. And there's also a whole bunch of other settings that I'm not even going to go into um, that have to do with um, what material are you going to print with and what temperatures are you going to print at and you know more printer specific settings. So. Um, any of you that have a 3D printer and you are interested in software, come talk to me after. <laughs> um, but the really cool part that I definitely wanted to make sure to show you guys um, is when we click prepare to print. And this is going to perform a function called slicing. So we've talked about printing a 3D object layer by layer by layer. You have to slice a 3D model into all the layers. Um, and then the cool thing is that you can preview exactly how the print will take place. So you can visualize and try to catch any problems before you start up your machine, waste any filament. Um, so I'll, I'll play that again a little closer so you can see exactly how that works. And it just 
that little pencil guy there kind of represents the tool head that's within the 3D printer and shows you how to, to build it up. Um, another thing that's really helpful um, when you're 3D printing is being able to see these build statistics up here to approximate how long something's going to take. Um, so you can see that even a kind of smallish model could take an hour or more to print just because it's building layer by layer. Um, so that's kind of how to print a, a model from start to finish. You have to go get a CAD model and then you have to translate it into a language that your printer understands. It's actually called G-code. Anyone that's worked with machines in the past probably knows that. Um, but that's how to print a model from start to finish. So now, we get out of here and we're back. So now that you've seen uh, a little bit about how to do it, you may be wondering why. Uh, why would I ever need to do this? Is it just for little trinkets? Uh, what could this actually be used for? Um, so actually, the large majority of 3D printing these days is done to create prototypes. Is there anybody in here that works with product design or development, research and development? We've got a handful. It used to be that the last step of your process would be a CAD model. Now we're seeing that that's the second to last step. You have a CAD model and then you actually print a prototype that someone can see and touch and hold. Um, the majority of 3D printing has been done for prototypes and proofs of concept. In fact, two thirds of the top 100 manufacturers are currently using 3D printing for prototyping. And there's about 3% of them that are actually using it for production, which is pretty cool. We've got an example of that later. Um, but just so you can visualize what I'm talking about when I say prototype. Um, so this is actually printed by a client of ours. Um, his name is Ken. Uh, and this is a one-to-one -one working prototype of a four-cylinder engine. Um, he's applied for a patent on it, so nobody steal it. Uh, <laughs> and one of those uh, large gray pieces up there took 36 hours to print. So if you think this elephant is going to take a while, it's nothing compared to Ken's engine that he printed. Um, but in terms of how is it being used other than just prototypes and manufacturing, we've got a lot of customers that are doing some really, really cool things with 3D printing. One of our favorite stories that we share is about this couple right here. Um, their names are Mike and Pamela. Uh, Mike is a customer of ours. And a couple of years ago, Pamela was diagnosed with a brain tumor um, behind her right eye. Uh, and the surgeon recommended doing a pretty invasive surgery. And Mike didn't want to put his wife through any unnecessary trauma. Um, so he did a little homework. He did a little research. He analyzed the scans. He's a very technological kind of guy. He made a 3D model of the scan of her brain and of her skull and figured out that the surgeons had actually misjudged how large the tumor was. It was much smaller and might allow them to do a much less invasive procedure. So to prove this to the surgeons and to you know, help them with their surgery, he 3D printed a model of her skull and him and the surgeons looked at it and figured out what would be the best manner of, of attack to get that tumor out. So thanks to that, they were able to do a much less invasive procedure for Pamela and she was able to go back to work only two weeks after having brain surgery. So they're doing some pretty cool stuff. Um, another big way, and some of you that were able to come up beforehand and kind of look around, um, is in the, world, uh, in the world of um, prosthetic devices. So I'm going to let Joey um, talk a little bit about how you 3D print a prosthetic. So it's a really great program called the Enable program, and they print a lot of prosthetics for children, as you can see right here. Um, not only in America, but definitely abroad. Uh, more third world countries where they don't have medical access we do. Uh, it's a great thing for these people to be able to 3D print a prosthetic especially since children are growing at such a fast rate that they need to swap through prosthetics really fast. Um, can you go ahead and work yeah. that? Um, so you can see here, if you only had part of your wrist, you didn't have the whole finger formation, but you're able to close your wrist. So you just gotta... Close it like that. Okay. Yeah, here, all of this for you. <laughs> um, so you just really just close it right here, and um, the pinky finger isn't hooked up, so you can see that's what happens when the string isn't connected, but when the string is connected and you make this motion, you can see you get a closing of the fist. And that's pretty much the same design all of these kids down here are using and the same one as this gray one on the table. Yeah. Uh, the, great, the great thing about the Enable program, um, I'm not trying to sell you guys on it, but just to show you how cool it is, is if you were to go to Micro Center and buy a $500, $600 3D printer, and you signed up for their program, you could print parts out in your garage if they need, you could ship it to them, and then they go get put into use. So it's, it's really interesting that you could be able to do that all from your garage and maybe help one of these kids. So that's something that we're really big fans of. Some people ask us, what's the coolest thing you can 3D print? Our first answer is always, oh, look at the prosthetics. So uh, I'll get back to Natalie. Thanks. Um, one of the great things you can see from some of these pictures here is that the kids can even have their prosthetic hand printed in their favorite color or with a superhero logo on it. Um, really, they can customize it. And it makes it a little bit more fun um, for a kid that, you know, unfortunately, for one reason or another, doesn't have a hand. Um, so obviously, in the world of medicine, 3D printing has a lot of really great applications. So we've talked a little bit about surgical preparation. So if you're going to have some heart surgery, your surgeon can 3D print a model of your heart and practice. Um, before he goes in there, or, or she, sorry, to cut you open. Um, 
also in the world of 3D printed implants. Um, we've seen a couple of, of stories like that in the news. Um, in Asia, there was a woman that had surgery on her spine, um, and they were actually able to 3D print you know, a, a piece of her spine that she was missing to put into her back, that she's walking around now with a 3D printed part in her back. Um, and then some of you may have heard in the news just yesterday, the FDA approved the very first 3D printed drug um, and it's, it's an epilepsy medicine um, that dissolves on your tongue. And the way that they 3D print it means that they can um, have a much faster um, you know, dis dissolution rate for the dosage that they need. So there's a lot of really cool stuff going on in medicine with 3D printing. Um, but kind of to get out of the serious mode, um, we do have a lot of customers and, and even myself um, that just print some fun stuff. Uh, so I've got a few pictures of some of the fun things or useful things around the house you can 3D print. So the very first one is from a very interesting customer that we have named Bo uh, that lives in Denmark. And he's decided that he really absolutely needed a life-size Eiffel Tower that would light up, uh, you know, I think it coordinates to music, possibly, um, to have in his hallway, because that was something that he's into. I guess things are a little different in Scandinavia. Um, and then we have this wonderful custom printed um, chess set and you know, a handful of different colors. Um, chess sets are one of the great things to start out with on 3D printing. You can find so many different models of them on the internet and print them for yourself to have a custom set just for you. Um, this one down here is actually a metal detector being used on the beach. Everything except the electronic components was 3D printed. So the handle, um, the very end piece, and that middle pole piece were all 3D printed. Um, and then lastly, um, I moved into a new house and I didn't have anywhere to hook my loofah in my shower. So I went to work and I 3D printed a hook because it saved me a trip to the hardware store. It was probably cheaper. <laughs> so that's just an example of some of the kind of more lighthearted ways um, that 3D printing is being used. Um, so because we are um, here in Cincinnati, I did want to talk just for a second about some of the unique things that are going on in Cincinnati that you might not be aware of when it comes to 3D printing. So we're actually a really interesting cross-section with three of the companies that are here in Cincinnati, including ourselves, of the 3D printing industry. So you've got Polar 3D um, that some of you may have heard of. Um, they produce hardware, they produce machines. Um, we produce the software that runs the machines, and then we have also in Cincinnati a company called 3DLT, I think they've been in the news a couple of times, um, where they're actually something called a 3D printing service bureau. So if you have a model or a prototype, something you want to print for your house, a custom product, and you don't want to buy a 3D printer and learn how to use it, there are people that you can send your design to and they can make that happen for you without ha you having to make the investment. So if you're only, you know, if you can't justify the cost of buying your own and learning how to use it, um, they could be a good alternative for you. And of course we have um, General Electric who's doing a lot of really great things in the industrial 3D printing space. Um, but the cool thing to think about is that even though we've got kind of this local presence with 3D printing, it's definitely a global phenomenon. Um, so many countries around the world are getting really involved, you know, investing and in, in putting 3D printers in schools. Um, just to give you kind of an example, we have customers in over 70 countries worldwide. Uh, we would have never thought that would happen. <laughs> so we've kind of seen a little bit about what people are using 3D printing for, but I wanted to kind of bring it more to the people in this room, how it could affect you personally. Um, and so, show of hands, uh, does anybody have a 3D printer at home? Do you know somebody who does have a 3D printer at home? How many of you want a 3D printer? Yeah. <laughs> um, how many of you think that in a few years there'll be one of these in everybody's house? There are a few people there, maybe. Maybe I'm, I'm with you. I'm thinking maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, but as it stands today, there are a few groups of people that 3D printing can really be useful for if you're in a handful of industries. So if you're in design, if you're in some kind of engineering where you need to build prototypes, 3D printing is perfect for you. Um, if you create custom products, like these people up here that will do a 3D scan of your body and then print you your own figurine of yourself, um, they're you know, living it up because for one-off projects, it's so much easier to 3D print it than it is to manufacture traditionally. We have another recent example from Cincinnati Children's, this uh, adorable toddler down here, Lily, with her pink glasses on. Um, she actually has a, a very rare skin condition. And before the doctors at Cincinnati Children's performed surgery, they printed a 3D model of her head so they could practice. You know, something like a facial surgery, you really, really have to be careful. Um, so she's definitely benefited from it. So if you're in medicine, huge applications for 3D printing coming to you soon. And then lastly, I sort of briefly mentioned education. So anybody in here have kids in school? A few? Do they have a 3D printer at their school? A few? Yep. Yeah. Um, so they're definitely coming. There's a lot of um, programs to bring 3D printing to libraries and schools and introduce kids to 3D printing at a young age. Um, and one of the reasons they're doing it is because 
it allows kids to think about problem solving in a bit of a different way. So instead of being constricted to, well, we can only fix it this one way, they can see a problem, scan it, build their own model, and print it, and then iterate and prototype and kind of go through that process themselves. The other trend we're seeing with education is that they're introducing kids to 3D printing at younger and younger ages because even as some of you probably experienced when you come up and look at the machine beforehand, once they see it, they want to know how to do it. Oh, that's cool. I want to understand how to print that. So once they see the end result, they're willing to put in the time and energy and effort to learn how to actually run one of these machines and everything that goes with it. Um, so there's some really exciting things we're seeing in the world of 3D printing that could affect you sooner than you think. Uh, my last example uh, in a way that 3D printing could affect you uh, is anybody in here in the midst of remodeling their kitchen or their bathroom? We've got one, um, maybe two. You might want to think about including one of these wonderful products um, in, your, in your home. This is actually uh, American Standard. Um, some of you may be familiar with them. They do all kinds of plumbing products, sinks, faucets, etc. cetera. Uh, they became the very first manufacturer to take a 3D printed product that had been 3D printed in metal and go straight to the consumer. So instead of just prototyping these and then sending them over to their manufacturing plant to be constructed the traditional way, they went completely 3D printed all the way through with metal, which is a really, really cool process. Um, and what this allowed them to do is not have to be constricted by any of the traditional manufacturing processes. You couldn't have actually convinced, you couldn't have produced these traditional manufacturing ways. Um, so what is really exciting for any designers out there is that you're no longer limited uh, to what conventional methods might constrain you to, you can really dream it, and if you can make a 3D model of it, you can print it. So if you would like to have one of these uh, delightful faucets in your home, don't worry, they're only $12,000 to $20,000 a piece. Um, <laughs> but if you don't want to spend 20K and still want to spice up your shower, <laughs> you can 3D print uh, this uh, T-Rex head um, to put on your shower head. So I know what I'm doing later today. <laughs> So uh, final question, and then we'll kind of jump into any questions that you guys might have, and Joey and I will do our very best um, to answer those for you. Um, where can you go to learn more? So maybe you've kind of piqued your interest about 3D printing, you want to learn more. Um, so I would highly recommend a place in Dayton um, called Proto Build Bar. Uh, anybody in here from Dayton or lives kind of near Dayton? There's a handful of you. If you haven't checked it out yet, definitely go and see it. Um, there, it's one of the very first ones in the United States. Um, it's a bar uh, where you can go, and they've got about a dozen 3D printers, and you pay by the hour to print. So if you don't want to spend $1,400 on your own 3D printer, um, you could go in there, and they're very, they're very nice, they're very helpful. Um, the great thing about it is not only are they a bar, they have non-alcoholic beverages, snacks, food, they're kid-friendly, um, so at certain hours you can bring your kids in. Uh, when I was there, they actually told me that their largest portion of their clientele are dads bringing their kids in to teach them how to make things. Because they've got soldering irons, they've got tools, they've got everything you would need to create your own project, of which 3D printing may be a component. So highly recommend checking these guys out. Um, it's a good way to, if you're not really sure, you know, do I want to get into this further and just kind of want to test the waters, it's a pretty inexpensive way um, to go and just kind of see it for yourself. If you are kind of interested in get it, getting deeper into this, um, there's something called a makerspace. So has anybody heard of or been to a makerspace? I kind of know what they are. So there's, there's a handful of you in the room. Um, a makerspace is usually run by an educational or nonprofit institution um, where they have 3D printers and other machines there. And Joey mentioned CNC machines earlier as well. All the machines, all the tools you would need to make something. Um, to make some kind of project. And there's a handful of them around. So there's a couple that require some kind of membership or subscription, like a manufactory up north and Hive 13, similar. Um, the Contemporary Arts Center, um, if you're interested in th learning about 3D printing, they have a makerspace, they offer programming where you can come in and take a look. Um, same thing, the Cincinnati Public Library branch just down the street, um, I believe they have some uh, makerspace and some 3D printers as well. And then lastly, Xavier University. Um, they have a really innovative space. I know they teach a lot of classes, even for adult students, on human-centered making um, and other ways to use new methods like 3D printing to create solutions for problems that people might be having. So um, if you're interested in getting in touch with them, they're very helpful also. So questions from you guys. That's all we have formally today. Perfect. Anybody? Anybody? Not or necessarily. We have folks like that Eiffel Tower that I showed you before. Um, he actually printed that in four separate pieces and then assembled it. 
Um, so if you're willing to put something together or have a 3D model that can be assembled and snapped together, um, that would be a way to do that. Joey, you have anything to add no, to that? It's a good description. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Because it will just what will happen is it'll extrude hot plastic and it'll just fall over the edge with nothing underneath it. So, any other questions? Go ahead. Sorry, you in the blue shirt. <laughs> uh, so, how strong is the material? Like, if you're building like a box or something, can you like stand on it? Yeah. Take this one. Um, you could probably stand on a lot of the parts you make as long as it's shaped correctly. I mean, um, in college, we one of my senior design projects was to build a skateboard that responded to EMG signals. And so the, pretty much the, to, to rotate the power from the motor to the wheels, we needed a, a special shaped shaft. And so the idea was we we're gonna 3D print it and then CNC it, but we ended up finding out that the 3D printed model was strong enough. So there are mechanical applications where you have the end goal of, all right, I'm gonna make this out of metal, but then you end up not needing to. So that's really helpful. And some, and some materials are stronger than others as well. Huh. You in the back of the glasses? I'm sorry. I think risks. I'm sorry. I missed that. Yes. Oh, risks. Yeah. It's always adult supervised. <laughs> um, and the, the great thing about some of these um, more enclosed ones is that, you know, we, we took the lid off so you guys could see the inner workings, but it has, you know, this little door on the front. A lot, some 3D printers are just, you know, this part with no casing around it at all, but in recent years they've started to develop ones that are enclosed. Um, maybe for safety reasons, um, but with when you've got kids, you definitely you know make sure you have an adult present, so nobody hurts themselves. Oh, yeah. do you want, what's your question in the, in the white shirt? Okay, is there only one tool that prints it, or do you have multiple tools that you Multiple nozzles. Multiple Yeah, you can. Um, we brought just one that just has a single. They're called extruders. That's still a shooter. Oh, is it a dual extrusion? Oh, we just don't have the other one loaded, sorry. Um, you, there's dual extrusion, dual extrusion printers out there um, that are similar um, to this one. I think I've seen as much of, as a five. There, yeah. Yeah, do you want? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, kind of more. Um, so the main thing with dual extrusion using two nozzles is you can have like a traffic cone where it's orange and white. Uh, we didn't want to bring too much in because there, there are, the, fa the fact is with 3D printers is there is a chance of error. There is a chance the filament isn't feeding through that can get jammed. When you have two shooters in the mix, you obviously double your risk. Um, so you just want to keep it simple, especially since I don't know if you guys is the first time seeing a 3D printer. But dual extrusion is something that's really great. Uh, it's something our software works really well with. Um, as Natalie mentioned, there's five extruders out there. There's, there's people who are doing all sorts of crazy things out in their garages and starting to sell them. And I, I mean, we honestly we've talked about it. Like, we can't think of any practical uses for five different extruders. But as the technology grows, I mean, it's, it's great to see what people are doing. Yeah, something we didn't really mention as much about 3D printing is that it started out mostly, you know, you couldn't buy a printer like this probably just a few years ago. You would buy a kit, put it together yourself. Um, and these are built to allow a lot of customization. So if you wanted to add all kinds of, you know, doodads and enhancements to it, you could if you were so inclined. So, uh, any others? We haven't gotten this out of here. Yes. What are some of the, the ranges of materials that bring crazy things all the way to the silver technique? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so metal printing specifically works a different way. Um, there's some, a process called selective laser sintering. Um, basically, you lay down a layer of metal powder, a laser fires on it and solidifies the powder, and then you put down another layer of powder. So it looks completely different from this machine. And those machines are typically a lot more expensive. Those are the quarter million. Yeah, those are the, those are the big industrial machines that would be able to handle that. Um, does that answer your question? Other materials? Yeah, I actually, I was going to mention that and I, I forgot about it. So um, we talked about printing human tissue. Um, there are companies out there that are experimenting. It's still early in the experimenting stages with human tissue. So they're not going to be able to print me a new liver tomorrow, unfortunately. Hopefully in a few years when I need one. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll figure that out. Um, but actually just a few months ago, L'Oreal entered into a partnership with a, a research firm called Organovo, um, working on bioprinting human tissue. And they've actually developed a human tissue that they can do product testing on. Um, so that's a pretty neat innovation. But that one's still a few years out as to when we're going to see. Here, here's a new heart for you. So, <laughs> it's going to be a while. Yep. Where do people go to sell their designs? So <coughs> that helped right there. That was free or did you have to pay? It was pay? free. There are sites where you have to um, pay for designs. Um, I don't usually use them because I'm cheap. 
so the fact that 3D printing has such, uh, such strong roots in the open source community, there's this really big uh, to get everything out for free. Um, so Thingiverse, I don't think you can buy a model on Thingiverse. I mean, they have millions of designs. I think they're all for free. So it's a great thing. There, I think there are a handful of sites out there, though, where you can, if you want to sell a design. I'm just curious if someone like a, a 3M, if they had to hook up there, like they're going to start giving their designs for a charge instead of... Instead of selling them in the store. I've read a little bit about that, but I think that's kind of still a growing potential field. There's, yeah, I mean, like, 3 Yeah. They start making like toys, you can pay like two dollars for each toy online. There's people selling files. Right? Absolutely. And there's people that you can pay to print your file also. That's we talked a little bit about that before. Black shirt? Yeah, I know the typical application for dual extruders is multiple colors, but can you use multiple plastic types? Absolutely, that's a great example. So we have some things that we printed in our office where they might be um, hollow underneath, maybe think like an arch where it needs to have some kind of material supporting it. Um, and they can actually, they make dissolvable filaments. Um, so what you could do is print your arch in one filament, print the support material underneath it in a dissolvable filament, stick your model in water, let it dissolve, and pull it out and your part's completely clean. Um, so that's the application that I've seen in our office in terms of using two different materials. That's a good question. Roughly, what would that cost just for the materials? Material cost, I'm not sure. It's like $4. Yeah, $4. Because, I mean, if you're going to buy a roll of filament, they run for what, like $30? $30, yeah. $30 or so for a roll, and they actually last a pretty long time. Because, um, like Joey said, the layer that's printing it is the width of two human hairs. Um, and it's not hollow on the inside. I don't actually have a part um, where you can see this, and our elephant's almost done, but. Um, you can choose to print a part completely solid if you want, uh, but you probably wouldn't want to because it would just be a waste of material. Um, so on the inside, it's almost this kind of like waffle pattern um, that you know, makes it so you don't have to print the thing completely uh, solid. So. Oh, to model? Yeah, there's definitely a difference between what you use to create a 3D model and then what you use to actually send those instructions to your printer. We work with the latter. So our, our software is what converts that 3D model into instructions that your printer understands. Um, I don't use CAD, because <laughs> I don't know how. But Joey, do you? Yeah. yeah. I typically use SolidWorks, but that's not a choice. We have people using SketchUp, AutoCAD, uh, you name it. And as long as you save it in a .stl file, which is pretty standard, it's pretty universal, uh, our software will take it. So that's where, yeah. And the other thing, if you're, if you're looking to import a model into the software, there are some repair options. So if you happen to build it in something different um, that maybe you know, left a few, a few holes here and there, you can, the software will help you repair it before you print it. That's a really, really good question. This is all you, buddy. <laughs> um, so really what a lot of people are doing is when you buy this from Flashforge or Dremel has a very similar design to this is you're almost paying a premium so you don't have to do all that because they've set it up for you. If you're the guy in the garage, maybe you like configuring. Um, it, there, there's a lot of values in it. There's a lot of firmware, but because everything's open source, the users, they have access to everything they need. Um, the idea though is that if you buy a printer like this, that it's going to work without you having a lot of maintenance. Um, so like, I'm sure you guys heard of MakerBot. Uh, so that's what they kind of sell on, the fact that you could maybe buy it and not have so many issues down the road. Yeah. In terms of things that you may have to get into um, mechanically that you might not have thought, uh, is making sure that the, the bed that you're printing on is completely level. So every few prints, you might have to go in and, and re-level it. Um, but I learned how to do it, and it, it's not that bad. And if I, if I can learn it, like the least mechanically oriented person you'll ever meet, then <laughs> it's got to be pretty easy, right? <laughs> um, any other questions? That's actually that's a very hot topic. Um, they're trying to push things through about banning the um, sharing of 3D printed 3D printing files for weapons um, because you can you can 3D print a weapon. And it, but the thing that we often tell people is it's just like any technology. Some people are going to use it to to do good, like printing 
prosthetic hands for kids in need, and some people are going to use it for evil. Um, but they're, they're, they're trying on the legislation, but... Oh, is our print done? Our print is done. There he goes. You guys will have to come up and take it. I think it's a beep, too. So <laughs> what? It might beep at the end. I'm not sure. Oh, it might beep. It's, oh, no, some, they sing little, all the printers have little songs that they sing when, they're, when you're starting a print and when you finish your print. Fun fact. I don't know whose idea that was, but... In the back of the white shirt. Are there any considerations for, I wasn't thinking of a legal, but say your book, say that was some other manufacturer's book and you just copied it and put it out there. Are there, is there anything missing or you consider doing that? Um, there's, I think a lot of brands are thinking about that and getting scared about that. Um, and they probably should because it's very easy um, to pirate um, anything now on the internet, unfortunately. Uh, fortunately for, for people like us, really. Um, but I think there will be a future time, kind of harkening back to your question before, where instead of trying to sell the product, they'll sell you the file. Um, so you're still paying for the product, it's just that you're manufacturing it yourself. In terms of legal implications, I'm honestly not really sure. Um, it seems that you know, the law is trying to catch up with the technology, but usually it's, it's lagging behind a few years. <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. It's the internet. Yeah. And it's, it's a global thing and it's very internet fueled then. So the people that usually get into 3D printing are very tech savvy. Uh, so that makes it all the more difficult to have something like that in place. Kind of building on that point, I'm assuming there's 3D standards, but you have a, mm -hmm. an object already. Yep. Build there's an app you can put on your iPhone for that. Uh, those aren't very clear, but oh, okay. they're, they're <laughs> Not definitely. Very <laughs> Um, you, can, you can buy a scanner, and um, there's one, I think it's called the Sense Scanner, it's about $1,500, and it hooks up to like an iPad, and so what you do is you kind of like, what I've seen happen is someone will sit down, and uh, you kind of walk around them with the, the iPad pointed at them, and it's the Sense Scanner, I think it's a camera built in, and it'll create a 3D model, it's pretty precise. There's a scanner in the library. Oh, yeah? No official like maker about whatever it is, and their scanner, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. It's crazy stuff. That's how they would have made those little... Personalized figurines is by doing a full body scan and then printing it. What's the name of that app? Oh, the app? I'm not sure. 3D scanning app? I don't remember it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. 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 Quick, okay. quick Google search with. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So. There's all kinds of crazy stuff out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, these are some really good questions, guys. I think we, we probably, unless you all need to run somewhere, we probably have time for a few more. The brain tumor? I'm not exactly sure which kind of scan it was, if it was a CAT scan or an MRI, um, but it was a, you know, a scan that would normally come out, you know, just in your regular format. But he's, yeah, he's a very, um, very talented guy. He actually has a, a weekly podcast that he does about 3D printing, so he's, he's very sharp. So he's the kind of guy to, to ask questions um, and, and not take just the first opinion, and so that's what led him to that. So, but the thing that we're discovering is that um, and why he wanted to use our software is that the more complex your model is, the more robust the software needs to be. Um, and a lot of the alternatives to our software are um, more open source, so they just come with a printer and they don't have really as much capabilities and speed. Um, so that's why he specifically you know, became a big fan of our software because there wasn't a single other software out there that could manage to print a file that was that complicated. You know, something that has a lot of contours as, as much as a, a human skull would. It's a pretty cool story. We, we, keep, we keep in touch with them for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take one more. Can I buy that Can you buy it? Uh, talk, talk to us after. Talk to us after. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much for hanging out today. Don't you have some of those elephants? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do.